This is not clickbait. The Major League Baseball owners colluded against the players in the mid-1980s. It's well documented what they did and the ramifications of their actions, and yet, how many people are aware of what really occurred? Did you even know the owners colluded prior to clicking on this video? Before getting into the details and the effects it had, there's a bit of context needed to understand. It is without doubt that the biggest and most conflicting aspect of the collective bargaining agreement is player contracts and everything associated with such. Free agency, salaries, team budget, luxury tax, service time manipulation, and everything under the sun has and will be feuded over between the players and owners as long as Major League Baseball continues to exist. Salary manipulation has roots going back to the 1800s in the form of the reserve clause and we're only one year removed from nearly witnessing a lockout of the regular season. Nearly 150 years of contractual disputes with no end in sight. The reserve clause was enacted in Major League Baseball for nearly 100 years before Kurt Flood challenged the owners and took the league to court in 1972. While the Supreme Court ruled against Flood, his actions paved the way to modern day free agency and the reserve clause was done away with in the mid 1970s. To overly simplify what the reserve clause was, it basically stated that a team had the rights to a player forever. Prior to the 1970s, players couldn't enter free agency like they do today. If a player was on a team, he was obligated to remain with them and sign whatever contract they offered for whatever amount. I'm sure it's obvious to you why that's not ideal. Imagine if the Athletics could have kept Matt Olson, Sean Murphy, Chris Bassett, Mark Hanna, Frankie Montez, Matt Chapman, Marcus Simeon, and Liam Hendricks while signing them all for practically nothing. It would be wildly unfair for the players. However, thanks to Kurt Flood and others, the reserve clause has been done away with since the 1970s and free agency has existed ever since. Naturally though, there has been no shortage of turmoil within it. That brings us to the 1980s. It had been nearly a decade since free agency was enacted in Major League Baseball and throughout its short lifespan, it saw numerous deals go down. Notably, Hall of Famer Catfish Hunter signed a 5-year, $3.35 million deal for the New York Yankees in 1975, the biggest contract given to a pitcher ever at the time. Another starting pitcher, Andy Messersmith, also made headlines by winning his reserve clause case and signing a 3-year, $1 million deal with the Atlanta Braves for the 1976 season. A slow but steady process, more and more players were able to enter free agency and rightfully sign contracts that earned them the salaries they deserved. According to Sabre, following the 1981 player strike, salaries grew by 47%, the average player salary had doubled, and more than 200 multi-year contracts were signed in a four-year stretch from 1981 to 1984. No more were the owners able to retain players' rights and keep salaries low, at least legally. In 1984, longtime MLB Commissioner Bowie Kuhn stepped down following the regular season and was replaced by Peter Uberoff. Uberoff's tenure as commissioner was short-lived, only holding the role for five years, and much of it was marred by owner collusion he permitted. According to multiple articles, Uberoth persuaded the team owners to prioritize profits over winning. On October 22, 1985, Following his first year as commissioner, Uberoth held a meeting with the owners to address the financial losses the league was facing. During this meeting, did he call the owners dumb for prioritizing winning over profits? Thanks to Uberoth, the owners banded together to maximize their profits. They became more interested in making money than winning. How does an owner maximize profits though? Perhaps the simplest way, reduce player salaries. In other meetings during that offseason, Uberoth was quoted saying, it's not smart to sign long-term contracts. They force clubs to want to make similar signings. He was also quoted saying the owners were dumb and stupid for their irrational spending, specifically saying, look in the mirror and go out and spend big if you want, but don't go out there whining that someone made you do it. I would like to repeat that because it sounds vaguely important. The commissioner of Major League Baseball told the owners that it's dumb to sign players to long-term contracts because it will force other teams to compete with them and do the same. Personally, I'm no financial expert, nor do I hold any high-ranking title in Major League Baseball, but isn't that kind of the point? One team in your division spends money to become good, so naturally, you spend as well to compete with them. From what I found, not one owner questioned Uberoth or attempted to stop this, and it's not surprising. 
I would be inclined to believe that most, if not all, of the owners still held grievances against the players for their role in enacting free agency, thereby costing the owners money in the long run. In layman's terms, the players stuck it to the owners, so the owners were sticking it right back to them. Following the 1985 season is when the first of three waves of collusion occurred. In order to reduce free agent spending, the owners in New Broth came to an unwritten agreement where the owners agreed not to compete with each other for that offseason free agent class. In addition to refusing any bidding and negotiations, the owners also agreed to intentionally keep salaries as low as possible. So imagine you're a free agent after 1985. You're in the middle of your prime and just came off a fantastic season. You want to make as much money as possible only to find out that you received one offer from the team you're already a part of. No other general managers bothered to offer you a contract and the one contract you did receive from your previous team was for an insultingly small amount. That's basically what occurred and it most famously happened to Andre Dawson of the Montreal Expos. I already made a video about his situation specifically, but he wasn't the only victim of this practice. Dawson in particular did not become a free agent until after 1986 and we'll get back to him in a moment. Perhaps the most notable player that was affected by collusion following the 1985 season was Kirk Gibson. Gibson, who spent his entire career with the Detroit Tigers up until that point, was coming off a career season. In 1985, he slashed 287 with a 364 on base and 518 slugging for an 882 OPS and 140 adjusted OPS. In nearly 700 play appearances, he hit 37 doubles, 29 home runs, drove in 97 RBIs, scored 96 runs, had over 300 total bases, drew 71 walks, and stole 30 bases. All but one of those stats were career highs, and in 1985 in particular, Gibson was in the top 15 among all MLB players in nearly every single one of those stats mentioned. Clearly, one of the best hitters in baseball, and a player any team would love to have. After the season ended, Gibson was in talks with the Kansas City Royals, the team that had just won the World Series. Despite winning the World Series, the Royals needed an outfielder, and Gibson looked perfect for the part. However, his agent spoke with then Royals general manager John Sherholz, who stated Kansas City didn't have any interest in signing him. Gibson's agent received similar stories from other teams he contacted, and therefore, Kirk Gibson had to sign the only contract he was offered, a measly three-year, $1.2 million deal to return to the Tigers. Another similar situation centered around future Hall of Famer Carlton Fisk. As a member of the White Sox in 1985, the catcher set career highs in home runs with 37 and RBIs with 107, all while taking home the Silver Slugger Award, being selected to the All-Star Game, and receiving MVP votes. In the offseason, Yankees owner George Steinbrenner offered Fisk a three-year, $2.25 million deal, but soon retracted that offer after he received a phone call from the White Sox owner Jerry Reinsdorf. Fisk would go on to sign back with the White Sox for only two years and $1.8 million. In total, during the offseason following 1985, there were 33 free agents and 29 of them signed back with their same team. In the previous offseason before collusion, there were 46 free agents and only 20 signed back with the same team. Kirk Gibson was off to such an excellent start, may be the focus of a legal battle in the months ahead. Now, the Players Association has filed a grievance charging that the owners got together and decided not to bid on Gibson and this year's crop of free agents. If the charges are true, this is called collusion, and it's against the law. Donald Fear, head of the Players Union, says you don't need a smoking gun to see what's going on here. There's no doubt in my mind there was collusion regarding Kirk Gibson. And Gibson is just the tip of the iceberg. Players declare free agency and only lesser players change ball clubs. Apparently no rival team seriously bid on Gibson or uh, Carlton Fisk or relief man Donnie Moore. Another aspect I didn't even mention yet was roster size. The number of players on the active roster was lowered. For over 100 years in Major League Baseball, 1910 to 2019, the active roster was 25 players. Ever since 2021, it's now been increased to 26, but the roster size did stay uniform for several decades until 1986. The active roster was cut from 25 men to 24 in another baseless attempt to save money. It might not seem like much, but that's one less player the owners have to pay. The Gibson and Fisk incidents, the roster size changes, and the astounding number of players to return to the same team all raised red flags, which caused the Players Union to file a grievance in February of 1986. 
When asked if the owners were colluding, Euberoth responded, they aren't capable of colluding. They couldn't agree on what to have for breakfast. Or what is your reaction to the charges of collusion concerning uh, the lack of movement of free agents? Well, if, if you're talking about Kurt Gibson, if he continues to play anywhere like he's playing now, I mean, he's worth the whole, all of the league. I mean, you can't play him, uh, pay him enough. I watched him in Cleveland just be outstanding. But I, I don't see collusion. Uh, salaries in baseball, unknown fact until this moment we speak about it, this year from last year will go up about $30 million. So the, the spiral is still continuing of increased amounts of money being paid to players. Free agency, I think, is going to continue as it has in the past. What happened last year is the owners opened the books. There was not a lot of talented players uh, other than Kurt Gibson. And also, I th there was the first time in baseball in a long time that people the year before had not had good success with free agents. You know, the players that, they, that went into free agency the year before did not perform very well. Those factors made it uh, really kind of hold free agency down. But it, it's alive and well. But how, how could it be that no one was well, interested you know, in Gibson? Basically, there's usually only about a half a dozen, dozen clubs that are inter interested in free agency. There's uh, you know, 10, 15 clubs that just never get in the marketplace. And those that did had just opened their books and embarrassed themselves and, you know, th threw all that red ink forward for the world to see and said, look at how terribly we're doing. And they just took a big, deep breath of air and said, oh, we're not going to be in that market. Well, I'm told Atlanta owner Ted Turner was interested in Gibson. And then there was a meeting in which you were involved uh, with the Braves, and suddenly there was no interest. Is that accurate? Not accurate at all. You know, I was down there for the uh, Martin Luther King Foundation uh, meeting the Holiday Commission, and uh, there's just no, there's no truth in that at all. He would later also comment on the grievance, saying, I still think each owner will do what he damn well pleases, and when people finally see that, the collusion talk will stop. If those responses aren't alarming, I don't know what is. The grievance that was filed not only didn't get resolved for over a year, it didn't stop the collusion one bit. If anything, it got worse. Following the 1986 season, there were even a bigger number of highly talented players entering free agency. Future Hall of Famers Tim Raines, Andre Dawson, and Jack Morris were on that list, as well as other notable players Ron Guidry, Bob Boone, Doyle Alexander, Rich Gediman, and Bob Horner. As mentioned before, I made a video regarding the Dawson situation, but in short, he basically had to force the Cubs to offer him a contract where he signed a one-year deal for the near-league minimum. With the exception of Dawson and Bob Horner, the other players mentioned would sign back with their previous team for less money than what they would have earned, and that's not even the worst part. Since those players waited to receive offers from other teams that never came, thereby having to re-sign with their old ball club, those re-signings occurred after the re-sign deadline. Why does that matter? Because those handful of players did not sign until after the deadline, they were forced to miss the first month of the season, not being eligible to play baseball until May. Seriously, if you look at the game logs for these players for the 1987 season, you'll notice that they didn't play a single game in April. Talk about keeping salaries low, the owners are not even letting the players play a full season. Speaking of the owners, they even tried to be sneaky about the collusion. Tim Raines, who would be 27 during the 1987 season, was coming off perhaps his best season ever in 1986 for the Montreal Expos. He slashed 334 with a 413 on base and 476 slugging for an 889 OPS and 145 adjusted OPS. That batting average and on base percentage led the National League, his 70 stolen bases were second in the league, and he placed sixth in MVP voting. A young, elite player in the middle of his prime and entering free agency. Normally, every team in the league would love to have a player like Reigns on the roster, but not during the collusion period. In the offseason, Reigns did receive contract offers from other teams besides the Expos. He reportedly received offers from the San Diego Padres and Houston Astros, but at salaries far below what the Expos offered. Other teams also approached his agent, but never made a final offer. So while technically he did receive outside interest, it was merely a facade to make it seem like there was no collusion. Reigns would be forced to eventually sign back with the Expos. Entering the 1987 regular season, free agent salaries had dropped 16% while team revenue rose roughly the same amount. Given all the schemes happening during the offseason, the MLB Players Association filed a second grievance in February of 1987. In another disgraceful act, Uberoth went on the record saying that if an owner wanted to offer a player a contract more than three years, 
They had to let him know. How Yibra thought he can get away with anything, I have no clue. Nearly 20 months after the first grievance was filed, also known as Collusion 1, the decision was finally settled. In September 1987, Arbitrator Thomas Roberts ruled that, yes, the owners did collude and were responsible to pay damages. Damage tolls were to be finalized at a later date, but the decision was made. The owners colluded against the players and had to pay back. Despite that, the owners and commissioner continued to collude against the players. An arbitrator ruled that the owners cheated, a second grievance was in the process of being determined, and yet, that did not stop the owners one bit. Am I insane for thinking, how could they continue this after getting caught and being on the hot seat for getting caught twice? Now they're going to do it a third time? If anything, the owners tried to be even sneakier with their collusion. To make a long story short, during the off-season following the 1987 season, the owners made all contract offers open and public amongst each other. They all knew who offered which players what amount of money. For obvious reasons, that's a huge conflict of interest as it would create a scenario where teams wouldn't offer a deal to a player because somebody else already did. Naturally, that plan didn't work out well for the owners. The players obviously noticed what was happening, and so in January of 1988, they filed a third grievance against the owners. I still need to know, why blatantly collude when you got caught twice and already punished once? Interestingly, around the time of the third grievance, the penalties for Collusion 1 were announced, and there was a notable situation that arose from it. Of the 65 players from the free agent class following the 1985 season, only 14 were still on an active roster, and 7 of those 14 were given a special deal. Long story short, they could opt out of their existing contract and re-enter free agency. Six of the seven players ended up signing different deals with their same team, but one player signed with a new team, Kirk Gibson. That new team that Gibson signed with was the Los Angeles Dodgers, and do you want to know what happened to Kirk Gibson that season? In 1988, he won the National League MVP award and hit the most famous World Series home run of all time. So yeah, if not for collusion, Gibson probably would not have been a Dodger, and the entire trajectory of the 1988 season changes. Dodgers fans can certainly think collusion for that World Series win. Moving on. After the third grievance filing, it appeared the owners and Yubaroth backed off. There was no collusion during the following free agency, roster sizes eventually reverted back to 25 players, and that seemed like the end of it all. Although, there still were the penalties from the two latter grievances. In October 1989, the second grievance, known as Collusion 2, was settled in favor of the Players Association, as was the third grievance, known as Collusion 3. The arbitrator for Collusion 2 and Collusion 3, George Nikolai, ordered that the owners owed the Players Union $38 million for Collusion 2 and $64.5 million for Collusion 3. That's also in addition to the $10.5 million owed for Collusion 1, as well as the other salaries and bonuses the players missed out on. A deal was eventually reached in 1991 where the owners would pay $280 million to the players affected by the collusion. If there was a silver lining to any of this, it would be how free agency evolved. Following the grievances rulings, the 1989 offseason saw a mirage of record-breaking contracts. On November 22, 1989, future Hall of Famer Kirby Puckett became the first player to make $3 million a year. One week later, Mark Langston broke that record, signing a 5-year, $16 million deal, which equates to $3.2 million per year. That $3.2 million per year would be broken just one week later, which was broken one month later, which was broken five days later, and so on and so on. Prior to 1986, no player made $3 million a season. In the 1989 offseason, six players broke the record for highest contract amount on a yearly basis. To put that into a bigger perspective, during the 1989 season, the highest paid player made $2.6 million per year. Roughly a decade later, in December of 2000, the highest paid player was making $25 million a year. All it took was one of MLB's biggest scandals to get the owners to spend money. As for Peter Uberoth, he stepped down as commissioner before the start of the 1989 season and hasn't been involved in Major League Baseball in any way ever since. His tenure as commissioner is bizarre to say the very least. He was the front of one of the biggest scandals the sport has ever seen, and yet was highly successful. He negotiated multiple television deals with TV networks worth over a billion dollars, settled issues with the umpiring union, 
saw increased attendance under his leadership, helped thwart a potential strike, and most importantly, helped MLB make a profit. According to MLB.com, most teams were losing money when he took office, and by the time he resigned, all were either breaking even or making money. That includes the baseball industry making a net profit in 1988, its first profitable year since 1973. Interestingly, the official MLB.com page on Uberoth has zero mention of his involvement in collusion, merely stating he did not seek a second term. Kind of weird how they forgot to mention that. I wonder why. Perhaps the league's most forgotten scandal, blatant owner collusion to finesse the players out of money, out of playing time, and out of service. Free agency will always have its ups and downs, but I hope we never see something as deceiving as this ever again.